Thank you folks for coming out and um, for, well, allowing me to use my uh, Halloween costume for one more day. It's the first time I've dressed up for Halloween in 10 years, and really it was a matter of my wife saying, we're going to a Halloween party, yes, you have to dress up in a costume. <laughs> so I bought this wig for $6.99 at Walmart, and I thought, I'm not going to just wear it once. That's just money down the drain, and also, and then I had to rummage through my wardrobe to find this stuff. I'm not sure, uh, does anybody know, get an idea of the character that I'm trying to play? Who is that? His name is The Dude, from The Big Lebowski. And this is a movie by the Coen Brothers. And uh, first off, um, I'm going to back up just a bit and, and warn you about what's going to come. I was uh, assigned the Punch Magazine kind of um, idea or theme or blurb. And we are going to get to Punch Magazine, but I do what like a lot of my clever students do, is when they don't like the assignment all that much, they just mention it and then talk about what they really want to talk about. So I'm going to go much a much broader view of what I'm going to call literary humor. And I thought, well, I already have this costume, and The Big Lebowski is a big movie. It's been around for going on 20 years, and even my 18-year-old students, over half of them in a class, knew it. And so that's pretty good staying power for a Hollywood comedy. And it got me thinking about why, does, why do some movies stick around? Why do some books stick around and others just disappear the year after they, um, they're made or they're released? And there are a lot of funny movies out there and uh, they, a lot of them will make you laugh, but there's only a few that really um, stay with us. And that's where I'm getting to this idea of literary humor. Now first off, if you think about what is literary and what isn't, I'm not, you know, really a genius or I don't know a whole lot about the history of words or anything like that, but I have to assume that the word letter has something to do with literary, and I, and I do believe that in one literal definition, it, it's literature is something that is written down. And, uh, but in another definition, literature has a kind of a wider meaning, and I don't know if you guys know that, but the uh, songwriter, musician, um, performer, Bob Dylan just won the Nobel Prize in literature. And that caused a buzz in the poetry world, and a lot of people loved it, and a lot of people hated it, and some people just thought, okay, whatever. But why did Bob Dylan win a prize in literature when he isn't really considered a writer? Maybe songwriter, but song always is going to go in front of writer there. Well, the definition I'm going to go for in my talk here is word-based art that has lasting effect and, and lasts through generations. So when you think about literature that way, it's more just the effect it has on culture rather than the fact of whether it is specifically um, a written form originally or not. So given that definition, I would say that The Big Lebowski by the Coen Brothers filmmakers is literature and it is humorous. I'm going to give you a little hint, uh, sh kind of look at what the Big Lebowski is. This is the dude, is the main character. He plays the role of a sort of private eye. He's not really a private eye, but he just gets kind of caught up in this crime. And I'll tell you more about it, but this is how he handles himself. I didn't check IDs, by the way, but they do say the F word in this clip a couple times. I hope you guys can. Hey, I've got some information. 
All right, it's a certain things that come to light. And, you know, has it ever occurred to you that instead of, uh, you know, running around uh, uh, blaming me, you know, giving the data of all this new shit, you know, it, 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 this could be a, a lot more uh, 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 complex. I mean, it's not just, it might not be just such a simple, uh, you know? What is God's holy name are you blabbering about? Well, I'll tell you what I'm blabbering about. I've got information, man. New shit has come to light. And, and shit, man. She kidnapped herself. Well, I'm sure, man. Look at it. You know, a young trophy wife in the parlance of our times, you know. She uh, uh, owes money all over town, including the known pornographers. And that's cool. That's, that's cool. I, I'm saying she needs money. Okay. And, you know, of course, they're going to say, hey, they didn't get it. Uh, uh, because she wants more. Man, she's got to feed the monkey. I, I mean, uh, hasn't that ever occurred to you, man? Sir? All right, that's probably enough of that. Uh, by the way, cheers. Um, <laughs> it's a little parched up here. And uh, the drink of uh, the dude drink of choice, by the way, is the White Russian. So, what is The Big Lebowski and why is it in my talk? Well, it is a satire. It's a satire of a tradition of film called film noir, which I'm sure you guys are aware of. Uh, particularly The Big Sleep, which is, you guys know, Humphrey Bogart as the ultra-cool detective, private eye, Philip Marlowe, He's always got it together. He's a tough guy, a wisecracker. Well, in the Coen Brothers' reimagining of the noir, you have Jeffrey Lebowski, the dude, a pot-smoking, white Russian drinking. Think about, um, if you think about uh, Philip Marlowe, he was a heavy drinking character too, but he always drank whiskey, you know, the man's drink. And so the dude drinks white Russians. He always kind of has one with him. And he doesn't, the big joke is that he doesn't know what he's doing. You could tell by this clip, he's obfuscating. His, his rhetorical style is a lot like my style when I uh, give lectures. So if you see me going, um, eh, that man, then it's just that I'm trying to act like the dude. It's, uh, it's planned. Um, so in essence, he is everything that Philip Marlowe is not. Um, he's clueless. He's, he, when he gets into trouble, he does so accidentally. He's constantly faking it, trying to pretend like he knows what he's doing. And ultimately, I hope I don't spoil the movie, but things work out okay in the end. But we realize that they work out just by blind chance. That the dude has really not affected things very much at all. This is a different vision of film noir, which is that there are dark forces in the world, but then there are these super people like Philip Marlowe who are on top of it, and they know what's going on, and they know how to pull all the right strings, and um, in the end, they're going to get the bad guys going to end up in jail. There'll be some collateral damage, but everything will work out. Well, the Coen brothers tell us that that really isn't how the world works. And I think that the reason why we still watch The Big Lebowski and we care about this kind of humor is that we recognize on some level that it's more honest than the Philip Marlowe, The Big Sleep narrative. In fact, most of us see ourselves more in the dude than we ever see ourselves in a Philip Marlowe character. You know what I mean? Don't we kind of muddle through life? We do our best. A lot of times we're confused. A good, per maybe I'm speaking only of myself. Um, a good percentage of the time we're faking it. We're pretending like we we know what we're doing, and we're just really relieved when we can pull it off and get away with it for a little while. And uh, certainly, uh, even my 18-year-old uh, students, as I said, a good uh, the movie was 1998, so that's going on 20 years. Um, they still enjoy this character, and I think it's a relief to us. To f somebody finally is more like the way I am, rather than these great detectives, these superheroes. So, this is our introduction. 
kind of a slow roll, um, getting things going to her topic, which is literary humor throughout the ages, just kind of not an exhaustive <coughs> um, um, examples or anything, of course, or catalog. But uh, let's see. This is the oldest written joke. Does anyone get it? <laughs> <laughs> but it would have been even a double joke if somebody did know how to read cuneiform because I just pulled that picture off the internet. It's not the joke at all. But the oldest written joke in history that archaeologists and Egyptologists or whatever um, people who do this kind of work have ever found a long time ago. Um, does anybody know the story? Does anybody want to just take a stab at what the subject matter of the joke is? Goats. What is it? Goats. Goats? <laughs> no. Others. Uh, it's a little cruder. It's a fart joke. <laughs> it is a fart joke. Do you want to hear how it goes? It doesn't strike me as particularly funny the way it's written, but it's kind of a saying. Um, <clears throat> it is something which has never occurred since time immemorial. A young woman did not fart in her husband's lap. And that's considered the earliest joke. I'm going to take this seriously for just a moment. Why is it that for my son, when he was one years old, before language, understood that farts were funny? Just seemed to understand it. What is it that makes it funny? It's a loud noise and an unpleasant smell. Um, that's not inherently funny, those two things. I mean, when people ride by on those Harley Davidsons with that are extra loud and that spew the smoke out, that, I never laugh. My reaction is different from that. Um, so what is it about the fart that makes us laugh so much? Well, it goes back to the Jeffrey Lebowski, the dude versus Philip Marlowe. It's something that we all pretend that we don't do, but yet we all do, and that we all know we do. It brings us down to earth, and it's funny, the tension between pretending that we have it all together and that we're above such pettiness and such animal stuff as bodily functions like that, but yet when one just seems to happen, um, we all laugh because it's a reminder of what is true, and that is that um, we may be very, very clever animals, but we are animals still. So, long time ago, I'm just going to kind of just jump through history here. We're going to go, what is that, 500 years? I think my math is a little off here. Um, it is, uh, what is that, 1900? So a long time uh, <laughs> later in the future. Uh, later in the future. Anyway, uh, Aristophanes, we're talking about ancient humor and ancient Greek, Greece. Um, there were a lot of plays. Uh, comedies that were quite popular. <clears throat> Aristophanes is the most famous uh, of these, and we know about them through various ways, and one of the ways we know about them are pieces of pottery, like this one. And they had a, well, if you look at this piece, again, I don't want to scandalize anyone, there's a man who has a funny looking hat on, and he looks to be doing some kind of dance. It's almost like vaudeville. Hello, my baby, hello. <laughs> and uh, if you look closely, or maybe you don't want to look closely, but there's something between his legs. And that is not a mistake, and that is not an anomaly. That is what you would expect to be between his legs. The standard comedy in ancient Greek plays had cost, featured costumes that had exaggerated phalluses. That was just part of the fun. So, we have farts, we have genitals. That's what is funny, I suppose. Um, we can imagine why. Um, you know, exaggerated phalluses on stage were funny. That's the thing you're not supposed to show. And yet, there is, and there is just something funny about it, let's face it. Um, not just crudeness and um, sort of uh, potty humor, you might call it. There were also a fair amount of political satire in ancient Greek uh, humor. And what that was, was really poking fun at the people in power. Now, if you could get people to laugh, you can make fun of people who have power. And 
for whatever reason, the person who is making the fun is protected. Whereas straightforward criticism sometimes can get you thrown in jail, can get you killed. But it seems to me that we as humans have just decided that if somebody can frame it in a way that makes everyone laugh, they get a pass for the most part. So, hurtling through, I'm going to have one more, um, I guess, uh, what off color slide here. This is a poet from um, 680 to 645 BC. He lived around that. This was a uh, this was a poet who came up from the bottom. He was a soldier, and he made himself uh, famous by fighting. And so he was what today we would call a working class um, sort of a character. And um, he would, because of that, he was able to be cruder in language and subject matter than most uh, poets of the day. And a lot of what he did was trying to take the wind out of the sails of the more proper poets. And here you get, he comes in bed as copiously as a Phrynian ass and is equipped like a stallion. Um, we, we know that comparison and uh, obviously it has, uh, um, has long roots. And again, uh, um, the purpose of <coughs> this writing, this uh, humor writing, I mean, it doesn't seem so funny, that little clip of poetry, but at the time, I think it was scandalous, and because of that, people tittered. Now I'm going to uh, jump ahead by thousands of years, and up to uh, 1616, and we're going to discuss, um, or I'm going to briefly talk about Cervantes and Shakespeare. They died days apart. They lived in the same time period, obviously, wrote in the same time period. Uh, one was Spanish, the other English, they're both European, and they both uh, are known, at least partially known, for their comedy, more so Cervantes, because he has one long epic work called Don Quixote. This is two long volumes of what is called a picaresque novel. Now this is, uh, as it is a funny story, it, well, let me just tell you what the picaresque is. Picaresque refers to a structure, a plot structure of a novel. They're almost always, they pretty much are always comic. And that is instead of the action building and building and building and building toward one big revelation or one big climax, instead you have a hero kind of character that goes out, gets into trouble, has this little adventure, and then goes home and rests and licks his wounds and then goes out and does it again, has a little adventure, maybe. It's basically the, the, um, uh, the image that I see is a barbed wire fence, like a piece of barbed wire. You just go along straight with a little snarl of action. You go along straight, snarl of action. And like I said, this is usually considered a humor, um, a um, comedic or humorous, uh, form, and it's usually not seen as important as a more proper novel. And this is a theme we're going to get to more and more uh, the more we delve into this subject, is that uh, if we laugh at it, we tend not, it doesn't get the same level of respect than if we cry, say. And, um, and yet, Don Quixote is perhaps the most influential novel in the history of literature. I say perhaps, you can make arguments for other books, but this one's up there. And what is it about? We know what it's about. It's, um, <coughs> it's this normal country gentleman, we would probably call him a middle class, regular guy, middle aged, and he decides for some reason that he's going to become a knight, a knight of yore. And not even a knight of yore, but a knight of fantasy books that he reads, knights that never existed, that fought dragons and so, so forth. And so he equips himself with his old nag of a horse and he gets some kind of old fashioned beat up armor and even puts a barber's basin on his head because he loses his helmet. 
And he goes through and he just gets thrashed and beaten over and over again. And the famous image is him jousting against windmills because he thinks they're giants. And it's kind of funny, you would think the joke would get old. It's not kind of funny, it's hilarious. You would think the joke would get old, but for some reason it doesn't. Why is that? I would suggest, because we all see ourselves in Don Quixote, and even though we know he's crazy, even though we know he can never succeed in what he's trying to do, which is live in a fan to bring a fantasy to life, we all hope he does succeed, because we all kind of want to live in that same fantasy world. So we see ourselves in this man who is essentially a fool. And uh, by the way, when you get to the end of Don Quixote, it's very touching. I mean, it, it goes from comedy to, uh, to pathos very quickly. Um, Shakespeare is, did, did, Shakespeare is the one um, element of this talk that didn't fit quite as nicely into my neat little thesis about what comedy is. And, and that's okay, I think he could be the exception, or just, he is what he is. He's worth talking about in any event. Um, and he has, his plays are divided into different groups, and some of them are called the comedies. It's worth noting that his comedies among Shakespeare scholars are not considered as important as his tragedies. His comedies, rather than being about sort of everyday losers, um, and that we get to laugh at. There's some of that, but mostly they follow a certain pattern that repeats itself through almost all of his comedies, and that is we start with order. Everything is fine, everything is, is, is as it should be, and if for some reason, usually by some kind of mistake, or a case of mistaken identity is the classic, everything gets thrown out of whack. Sometimes like fairies or supernatural characters, kind of pull a mischief on the, on the human mortals, and everything gets screwed up for a certain period of time, but then it all, order gets restored to the cosmos at the end. Twelfth Night has a lot of different crazy things going on, um, but one thing that happens is that one of the main characters, a man, feels himself having increasingly intense erotic feelings for another man. This, in Shakespeare's day, and in some ways in our day, is considered out of the ordinary. This is considered chaotic. This is not as things should be. Of course, in Shakespeare's day, as in now, we also know that it is quite common and that it, it happened. Um, but, as far as Shakespeare went, as a playwright, he understood that his audience would see this as um, odd. Um, but how does it work out? How do things finally write themselves? Well, it turns out that the man, the main character is in love with, is a woman who, for very complicated reasons, have, has to cross-dress and pretend to be a man so that she can avoid this or that. And then at the very end, everything is revealed. Actually, I'm in love with a woman, not with a man. Everything's okay. We don't have to get excited about, about things. The end, everybody gets married, and um, everything is restored to rightness. His tragedies, on the other side, on their hand, Everything starts probably already pretty bad, and then gets worse, and then it gets worse, <laughs> then it gets worse, and how do you know when a Shakespearean tragedy is over? What's that? Everybody's dead. <laughs> it's just pretty much everybody is dead, and, and, and uh, Hamlet, he left uh, one person alive so that that could be the person that tells the story. And um, Horatio, is that right? So, does Shakespeare fit into my, into my um, little system of uh, comedy being? I don't know. I suppose you could, you could push him into this idea that comedy is an outlet. It allows us to, to explain to ourselves how things go bad, and then it gives this positive idea, hey, it'll all work out in the end, unlike the tragedies. Now, everything that I've done so far has been the Western canon, and I try to challenge myself and challenge my audience by getting outside of, of the more familiar, and um, in this case, I, know, I happen to know of this story, and I think it's great, so I took the opportunity to uh, share it with you. It is called, What's This? My Balls for Your Dinner? 
Um, it is a Sioux oral narrative. Uh, first, it was recorded in, uh, the Ameri according to my Norton American Literature text in 1850, but that's when American colonists found a Sioux person to tell the story to them and then they wrote it down. It had probably been told for hundreds of years, if not thousands of years before that, or stories like this. <coughs> Here's the story. There are two characters. You guys are familiar with the idea of the trickster, right? The trickster is a character throughout literature and throughout myth and all different cultures. And the trickster tends to be a scoundrel. The trickster is always after his own good or her own good. They tend to be mythical creatures that can shape shift and change sexes. But what they have in common is they're always out for their, themselves. They're greedy. They're gluttonous. And yet, and they always get in trouble, and they always expose the hypocrisy of other people as well. But yet they are great teachers. They're not great teachers in the way that we usually think of teachers, but by their negative examples, they teach us things. And um, so these, are, these characters are wonderful uh, recurring uh, characters for, these, for, for all kinds of stories throughout history and throughout cultures. In this particular one, you have Coyote and, um, what is the character's name? It's called Spider-Man, which seems a little odd nowadays. Um, he was, certainly predates the comic book character. Um, his name is Iktumi, the Spider-Man. <coughs> and, uh, and Coyote, they're buddies, and they're both scoundrels. Now, Iktumi wants to impress Coyote, so he's having him over to his house for dinner. And he really wants to kind of make... Um, coyote envious of his life and feel like he's been a good host um, for all the kind of selfish reasons we like to be good hosts and we look good publicly. And so, Iktumi has his wife. He has two nice juicy uh, buffalo livers to cook up for dinner. And the wife, by the way, never gets a name. She's just Iktumi's wife. And um, so, Iktumi says, hey, Woman, you, and he treats her roughly, kind of, he bosses her around. It's also known that he sleeps around and does all these bad things and expects her to clean up and do all this stuff. So he tells her, you cook those things up and, uh, and I'm going to go off and I'm going to try to get a rabbit to supplement it and also make some acorn, you know, bread or whatever. And because Coyote, I want to give him as much as he can eat so he'll be nice and, and impressed. And she goes, well, what am I going to eat? He goes, well, you can eat whatever we don't finish. You can eat our leftovers. He goes, now, he's going to come over, and you make him feel welcome, but he's going to try to put his hand up your robe, because that's what he always does, but don't let him do that. All right, bye. And he, so he leaves, and um, Iktumi's wife, he's going, I he can't believe he did that. They're not going to give me anything to eat, and she's just grumbling as she's cooking these things. Like, you know what? I'm just going to try one of these. Takes a bite. It's delicious. She has another bite. Pretty soon, she eats one of the livers. She says, oh, no. Now he's going to be really mad at me. He's going to beat me. I might as well eat the other one. She eats the other liver, just eats it all down. Just then, Coyote shows up. Hey, Coyote, Iktumi is out. He'll be back in a little while, and uh, blah, blah, blah. And he goes, oh, now that he's gone, and he immediately puts his hand up her robe, just like Iktumi told her. But instead of her telling him not to, she goes, okay, do what you want to do. And so they have sex um, right there. And she's like, you better hurry. He's going to be home soon. And it's a pretty ribald story. And uh, so she has sex with Coyote, and then when they're done, he goes, so, what's for dinner? And she goes, oh, you've never been to our house for dinner before, huh? Well, what we always do is we always serve the balls of our guests. It's like, what? You've got to be kidding me. And, he's, and she goes, oh, no, it's, you'll love it. And don't worry about it. She takes out the carving knife, and she starts sharpening it, walking it toward him. And he's like, wait, wait, you, you've got to be kidding me. He's like, no, this is a, you don't worry, just sit still. I'm very good at this. It'll, it'll be over in a second, and it'll be so delicious. You'll love it. And he goes, oh, wait, just one second. Um, I'm going to go outside and use the bathroom, and I'll be back. And she goes, okay, and he leaves. Immediately starts running for the hills. <laughs> Meanwhile, Latumi shows up, and he goes, hey, where's that? Why is he running away? She's like, oh, that scoundrel, he ate both the buffalo livers. <laughs> and then he just ran off because he was afraid. And he's like, what? And so Iktumi chases after Coyote. He's like, friend, friend, I would have given you one. He's like, well, brother, 
if you can catch me, I guess you can have both. And that's the end of it. <laughs> it's a great story. And, uh, and it has this nice little lesson about, what is the lesson? It's a pretty simple lesson. It's one, if you don't treat your wife well, she's probably going to figure out ways to get back at you. And also, just in a more general way, if you think you have the power over someone else, you should be careful because that person may be cleverer than you, and that person is going to have a lot of motivation to get back at you, and they probably will succeed at some point. So, um, <clears throat> so finally, we got to Punch Magazine. Now, I... I don't know all that much about it except that I, I started looking it over and um, it was a forum for political satire. It was a place where writers could express themselves and um, it lasted for many years and then was revived for a short period of time, 1996 to 2002 you can see. Um, but before that it, it lasted for quite a while. Um, of course, political satire had been in place for a long time. We know that the Greek, the ancient Greek plays had a political sat satire was part of a, um, part of their their routine or part of their function. And the other thing is that um, in what year was it? Let me see, I've written down. 1729, a little pamphlet appeared called A Modest Proposal by Jonathan Swift. It's probably the most popular, well-known form of um, satire that, that we know as uh, Westerners, at least. So Punch was, um, was not reinventing the wheel in terms of what it did, but it gave a forum for writers to where Jonathan Swift had to publish his own, basically self-publish, a pamphlet that was released in Ireland and just kind of handed out on the street, or maybe they were sold, I'm not sure of the economics of it. But now you have a magazine that's devoted to this kind of writing, and it, um, even um, Sylvia Plath even contributed to Punch at one point, the great poet, tragic poet. Um, and uh, it's, it's interesting, I couldn't find the, the exact um, article that she'd written, um, but uh, that would be a fun research project. The thing that I would say Punch really did, as far as my own understanding of culture now and, and where we live now, is it is credited with inventing the cartoon. That is, the political cartoon that we see in the op-ed page of the newspaper. And here we see a version of it. This is the first on the uh, left, on your left, yeah. Um, you see the, that's the very first cover of Punch. And later, I just picked up a cartoon that looked um, just good representative. And it was a way to, it says, uh, this League of Nations bridge was designed by the president of the USA. And it's a bridge that has all these different countries that have um, contributed to it, except for the United States. So it was a bag on the United States for for essentially saying, let's build this thing, but then not actually um, contributing to it. Now, this is the kind of thing that went on. Um, here is something that is really apropos of the moment. Um, to me, it seems like the New Yorker magazine, their comics are very much come straight from Punch. And if you look at Punch in the later years, they look just like this one here. Um, Anybody uh, watching the World Series? <laughs> Any Cubs fans here? All right. Still got a pretty good chance, I think. Here is, if anybody's a big baseball fan, and you, you know the manager comes out, or the pitching coach comes out to the mound, um, we know how this feels. Here's the, he's, uh, the pitching coach is hugging the pitcher, and the text says, I love you. We all love you. Now throw some strikes. <laughs> and I think that's kind of what I think that's what happens on those those <laughs> mounds. You just try to make them feel good. You're doing great. Um, so moving on, America, of course, takes Punch, which has a kind of a classy, maybe just because it was so old. And in typical American fashion, we uh, make it a little glitzier, maybe a little cruder. Um, these two uh, covers, Mad Magazine, which is still 
I can't believe it. It is still very much in business. The issues are coming out constantly. I read it as a child. Um, I'm not sure how. It would take a little bit more reading and thought and effort on my part to find out where Mad Magazine sees its place in history and culture. Is it for children or maybe like teenagers? Or is it serious satire? I think that's a subject for its own kind of um, discussion. Certainly the, uh, the subject matter is Alfred E. Newman popping out of Trump's head is um, adult. And yet the, uh, the cartoon way of doing it does seem like it's for children. Um, National Lampoon, this is, they were um, big in the 1970s, came from Harvard University. And uh, certainly more adult, more racy than Mad Magazine. In fact, I was looking over all the covers and different articles, and there was a lot of sexual kind of erotic stuff, a lot of scantily clad people in attitudes of, um, I suppose, uh, romance or flirtation. Uh, this one is a, a very clear you know, poke at the American president um, in that Bozo the Clown has joined those on the uh, on uh, Mount Rushmore. So this actually, I'm almost done. I just want to wrap this up with a, my kind of final thoughts, and that is, and that is just that comedy or humor, especially literary humor, anything that has lasting artistic merit, but makes us laugh, plays an important function. And it usually, if you look at the Academy Awards in Hollywood, for example, a comedy almost never wins any major awards. Almost never. And it, you always have to have this kind of tearjerker kind of movie to win the award, even if the tearjerker movie isn't even that good compared to the comedy. Um, likewise, Shakespeare's tragedies are always considered much more important than his comedies. It's all the way through history we tend to just kind of brush off comedy. I would suggest that it plays a very important role indeed, and I wouldn't say that one that, say, tragedy or drama is more important or less important than comedy, but one doesn't work without the other in a way, and really what the, the purpose of tragedy seems to be, or drama, is to remind us that things are important, that we matter, our lives matter, other people's lives matter, you know, suffering is real, victories are real, we can't overcome tough odds, we are, it's amazing to be here on this planet, in, a, in this incredible kind of mystery of existence, all worth taking seriously. And yet, comedy tells us, not so fast. The fact is, we probably don't matter all that much in the grand scheme of things, and we probably shouldn't always take ourselves so seriously. And really, if all humans disappeared from the planet, I think a lot of animals would probably be pretty happy about it. <laughs> and the universe would continue to, to go on. Um, certainly with any particular person, whether we do this or that, or, or my particular sadness on one day, it probably isn't that big a deal in the grand scheme of things, because really, we're ridiculous people, we're trying to pretend that we know what we're doing, and hopefully we have a good time while we're here. I think that's what comedy reminds us to do, to not take ourselves so seriously. And I'm going to end with a, it has something to do with modesty, I think, and with humility. Comedy asks us to be humble, and to remember that we're not such a big deal. And that's important. Just as it's important to also remind ourselves that actually we do matter. You know, each one of us matters and our connections with others matter, etc. So we need both of those things to get at some sort of truth. Now I'm going to end just on a recommendation, a reading recommendation. I'm a little bit embarrassed to move this last because I did a very immodest thing, and then I plugged my own book among a couple others, and not knowing that Kai would do such a great job <laughs> of it already, um, and I know it's very un-Midwestern Lutheran 
to self-promote, but I am from Los Angeles, so I think that self-promoting should probably come as no surprise to anybody. Plus, my publisher is, I'm pretty sure he's going broke, and uh, <laughs> if I can't sell a couple books, I'm, I'm worried about him. So, <coughs> Charles, this is just random, some books that I really liked. Charles Portis is a fantastic author, novelist from Arkansas. He's probably going to die pretty soon. He's very old. And um, I hear he's been sick for a little while. Uh, and um, his, he wrote all through the 70s. He was a Korean War veteran. And um, he wrote for just a short period of time. He's most famous for writing True Grit the novel that the John Lane film, and later a Coen Brothers film, is based on. Now, True Grit, the movie, the John Wayne movie, has its charm, but it is nothing like the novel. The novel is so funny and so touching in ways that it's, it's impossible for me to describe without really going on and on. But I would, instead of that one, I'd suggest The Dog of the South um, as a starter. And it is about a, it's kind of a, an epic story and it's almost like a whodunit in that the main character's wife and some guy he works with steal his car and his credit cards and run off and he's following them by, by kind of tracking their movements through the credit card receipts coming in the mail. And so he's following them down from Arkansas into Mexico and Belize and it's this epic travel adventure and this almost a revenge drama, all this stuff. And all of that is fine, except for the character is such a doofus. He's kind of the dude in a way, but he's actually more of like a guy who wears a suit when during the hippie revolution, when everybody else is loose and cool, he's the guy that wears a tie every day, even in Mexico. And he's the pill, is what his, his wife's mother calls him. Anyway, it's really fun. I love it. A little more serious, but also a lot of fun, is Milan Kundera's The Book of Laughter and Forgetting. This is called fiction, but to me it seems more like essay. It's, uh, there's kind of stories being told, but really the stories serve this idea that the author is trying to get at about laughter. A lot of the ideas that I'm talking about today, Kundera, really gets even deeper into. Um, in particular, a little teaser, at one point he talks about when God and the angels came down, or there was a confrontation between God and the angels and the devil and his minions, and God and his angels had everything on his side. They had the power. They had um, rightness and righteousness. And the devil and his minions had nothing, really. They were, they were obviously the bad guys. They were cast that way. They were inferior in power and inferior in moral morality, moral rightness, I guess. What did they have? They had laughter. He says that's how laughter was invented. All they could do was laugh at the angels for being so full of themselves and so right. And um, anyway, it probably doesn't um, translate that well the way I'm paraphrasing it, but it's a wonderful book. And then Kai already told you about my book. I like to think that it's funny. Um, that's something that some of the reviewers have touched on, but mostly it was taken more seriously on some level than I wanted it to. <laughs> And so that's my talk. I'd be really, thank you so much for uh, coming out and listening to me. And um, I'd be totally happy to uh, answer some questions if we still have time. Yes. Can you tell us a little bit about your book? Oh, <laughs> sure. <laughs> I should just start reading it. <laughs> sure. Um, my father, it's a father-son book. Um, memoir, and it's also a memoir about travel. And so, um, what's at the, the sort of inciting incident of the narrative is my father being charged with a very serious crime and telling me that he's going to go away for maybe forever, and then jumping bail and disappearing for many years. And then later, 10 years later, as I was in my 20s, he got captured, and that coincides with the moment that I just sort of, I had just um, graduated college and was starting to become an upstanding citizen, you might say. And then I, instead of continuing on that path, I just bought a uh, 
a cheap ticket to Guatemala and just landed there and had a couple thousand dollars in my pocket and, and just vagabonded around for several months. And, and it's really about, about my adventures in traveling and my attempts to reconcile with my father who I thought was out of my life and then suddenly came back in life, but he came back in as a prisoner, which was not, you know, I wanted him to just stay gone where I could just imagine him just being an outlaw rather than, and he wasn't a, a terrible person, but he was a flawed person. So, it's about that. <laughs> <laughs> yes? In literary humor has changed history in time, or does it just poke around and inflate the office a little bit? Do you think of any time where it really yeah. changed history like Britain or anything? My, my, my guess is that yes, that it, it must have um, shifted the way that uh, things work, but I, but to come up with a really specific example, I have to think that someone like Voltaire and um, writing during the Age of Reason really um, helped propel that movement, and then the idea of moving from a, a a mainly religious view of the world into a more scientific view of the world obviously has had incredible effects on our world. And um, to what degree specifically Voltaire or anything that Voltaire wrote actually led to like the scientific way that we live, the scientific revolution is very hard to say off the cuff. Um, I think that somebody could make that case in a dissertation or something, but it would take a lot of careful reading and some causal, causal arguments of this, he did this and this person, and the king read this and then the king changed the policy. Um, <clears throat> I guess uh, drama probably does have more impact more obviously. I think of the social realists. This is a term for um, kind of late Mark Twain era of American literature and you had a lot of writing that was about exposing the horribleness of the world in a lot of ways. A lot of times it was an indictment of capitalism. And so you have Upton Sinclair's um, The Jungle, I think I'm getting that one right, where he exposes the meat industry and then it got popular opinion really. Uh, the last time I gave one of these talks years ago, I talked about um, Uncle Tom's Cabin, which some people said made the Civil War inevitable. That was what, it polarized the sides to such a degree that there was no chance of avoiding war. There was no compromise anymore because of that book. Um, both of those books are notable in their complete lack of humor. And so it may be that um, humor may change us on an individual basis, but it doesn't have as much chance of, uh, I think it, it probably doesn't change policy quite as much because laughter doesn't seem to be as powerful as fear or pathos in terms of motivating people. But I think it may be more likely to make us smarter. I don't know, maybe a modest proposal. I didn't study up on that enough to know if that actually changed policy or change. It probably changed some minds, though, about um, the British treatment of the Irish is what that was about. Yes? Well, nursery rhymes were political satire in England. Yeah? How so? Um, I mean, I believe you, but... I beg pardon? I believe you, but I'm wondering, like, what, what is a good satire? Well, I'm thinking, like, Humpty Dumpty. Yeah. You know, sure. Uh, I can't think of another one. Yeah, There yeah. are yeah. lots of them, but... Um, Once he you falls know, apart, yeah. All, all of them are a lot of them, like, old James old. They yeah. were all satire from the rulers. Sure. But it was veiled so that we don't need to Yeah, a lot of that satire is like that. It's, um, you're directly poking fun at particular people, but you, you hide it just enough. Everybody knows what you're talking about, but it makes it hard for that leader to come after you because... Yes? Um, we heard a lot about what, what you did being a bartender and how you kind of moved around and graduated from college. How did you get to Augustana and what education course did you take? What education path, I'm sorry. Well, 
Um, the final chapter in my book, I'm going to give it away, well, the second, <laughs> the last five, I basically go to graduate school, and I went to, uh, um, I got a Master of Fine Arts at Georgia State University in Atlanta. And I wanted to get away from California, which is, you know, not very many people say they want to get away from California. Some do. It's expensive and there's some downsides. But um, sometimes when you get away, it's hard to get back. And, but uh, I went to Atlanta. I was there for a number of years. And then I went to Western Michigan University and got a PhD. And um, in creative writing and contemporary literature. Yeah. And um, you know, I was always setting about to have a career as a writer in some way. But I liked teaching and was pretty good at it. And I wanted to write what I wanted to write, rather than, when you want to make money writing, you either can be just one of that, that fraction of 1% that writes literary masterpieces that are exactly what you want, want to write, or you have to really compromise on the subject matter and write what people want, you know, write for magazines. And, and, and that's, a, that's something I didn't want to do. I wanted to write absolutely what I wanted to write, and then, but I also wanted to make a living. <laughs> and so uh, academia was good for me. I enjoyed the classroom. I enjoyed the, the campus. I enjoyed just pe being around a lot of people who like to learn, and um, both students and teachers. And so I applied for jobs after I got my PhD, and Augustana made me an offer, and other, a couple of other places did too, and I chose Augie. And uh, I've been here ever since. How long has that been? Nine years. 2007, if that if the map is right. <laughs> well, if I can, Dr. Daniels, I'll ask you to leave this screen up for just a moment. The library has done something really cool. These are little post-it notes. They're over here. If you want to write those titles down, they've even given a couple of pens tomorrow. But you can write those titles down there. Just a last word about uh, today and next Tuesday. Um, First, the whole subject of comedy, I was reminded last week we had a special celebration for Don Wooten. And if you ever did the comedy, the Greek comedy, I mean, we, we, there were some of the oldest jokes, recorded jokes you can find in those comedies that would be at the end of the season. But if you ever did one, you know the story I'm about to tell. Because he would get so mad at the actors uh, two days before opening night. And he would make us all shut up and sit down on the stage and he would tell us the same story about a very famous British character actor from the early 20th century who was dying and, and was approached on his deathbed by his loyal fans and followers. And one said, is it hard to die? And the actor said, no, no, dying is easy. Comedy is hard. <laughs> and uh, that's how we would get it out of us. But remember that next Tuesday uh, is our final lecture in this series by Bill Hammer, and the reason I want to put in a special note to you to tell your friends about this is it's no longer any secret. We've been interviewing for a, um, a paleontologist slash, slash evolutionary biologist because Dr. Hammer's retiring. And we hope we'll keep him here in our community like we have with, uh, with Dr. Tweet, but this may very well be his last freeze lecture. So I encourage you to tell your friends to get out here and we'll pack the place for Dr. Hammer. But for now, remembering that there are some treats right outside here where we can carry the conversation forward, I ask that you join me in thanking our speaker, Dr. Kelly Gaines.